if it's determined that a student with one of the following specific disabilities needs special education services, an individual education plan or an IEP is developed. Does anybody here have a child that has an IEP? Great, okay, so some of you are familiar with that. Does anybody here have a child that has a 504 plan? Perfect, okay. <laughs> okay, so these are the 13 disability categories under IDEA. Autism, deaf and blindness, deafness, emotional disturbance, hearing impaired, mental retardation, multiple disabilities, orthopedic impairment, specific learning disabilities, speech or language impairment. And this is where a lot of the, the pulmonary patients that I see um, fall is the OHI or the other health impairment. That means having limited strength, vitality, or alertness, which results in limited alertness with respect to the educational environment that is due to a chronic or acute health problem, such as asthma, ADD, ADHD, diabetes, epilepsy, a heart condition, um, a whole gamut of them. And also, it adversely affects the child's educational performance. So uh, traumatic brain injury and visual impairment. So um, there's actually two ways that an IEP evaluation could be started. And Linda, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I'm speaking specifically about how you as a parent could request one. So um, that would be you would make a referral, preferably in writing, to the school site resource teacher or principal. Um, I would also suggest that at the time that you make that, you have some medical documentation about your child's diagnosis. And as Linda was saying, in order to get that documentation, you're going to have to complete the HIPAA form. Um, there's so many state laws and federal laws that protect your child's health information. Sometimes, I'm sure as a parent, you must feel like it's really difficult just to get your child's own health information. Um, but if you complete that in, in our clinic, you compl complete it in the actual clinic, or you can go to health information, complete the HIPAA form, and then that gives you access to your child's health information. So if you can have something from, um, hopefully from your pulmonologist, that says what your child's diagnosis is, a list of their medications, um, you know, just a, a basic medical summary, then that's going to make it a lot easier for you to start this whole process. So once a referral is made, the school district personnel develop an assessment plan and deliver it to the parent for consent within 15 calendar days of receipt of the referral. Um, the IEP meeting is scheduled within 60 calendar days from the date the district receives the parent's consent on the assessment plan. So notice that it's the 60 days starts once you have signed the consent. So if the authorization that you're giving um, will be for the specific tests that they would be um, doing on your child. Is that correct, Linda? Okay. And then the IEP team will meet and review the IEP evaluations. Um, some of the people that might be at that IEP evaluation would be the, um, somebody from administration from the school, the classroom teacher, the resource teacher, um, the, uh, the parents, of course. Um, if the child is over 13, then he would also be there. And then if the student is eligible for special education services, an IEP is developed and annual goals are established. An IEP review meeting is required at least annually or before any significant changes. Um, I have seen, unfortunately, for a couple of families when they moved either school districts, um, maybe from San Diego Unified to Grossmont or something like that, or from a different coming from Riverside County into San Diego County, and they either the parents didn't have a copy of the IEP or it had been reviewed at the beginning of the year and things had significantly changed before their move. Unfortunately, that made it really difficult to get the interventions in place that that child needs. So I would suggest that you keep a copy of the IEP and that um, 
if there are any significant changes that you request to have it reviewed again. And then re-evaluation re is conducted at least every three years. Um, these are some very general classroom accommodations and modifications. Preferential seating, provide copy of notes. Sometimes the notes are actually taken by um, another person in class. Peer tutoring, a second set of textbooks at home. Taped material, um, provide copies of materials to be copied from the book or board. Absences, don't count against their grade. Not that they're not gonna have to do the work, but that they won't get penalized if it's not turned in at the due date. Um, and then access to water or be able to keep a water bottle at their desk. And then some assignment accommodations and modification examples would be to have an assignment book, to have modified assignments where they still have to demonstrate their ability to do the specific work, but maybe instead of doing 50 math problems, they can demonstrate that they understand it and they can do it by doing 20 math problems. Um, extended time to complete the homework, the classwork, or the projects, and a study guide. And test accommodations and modifications, some examples are extended time to complete the test, use of a calculator, use of a word processor, a different test location, or a modified test. And then the Section 504 plan is an additional law that applies to students with disabilities. Section 504 differ differs from IDEA, which defines disabilities in terms of categorical labels. Section 504 is broader in scope. And the criteria for the 504 plan is it's persons who have a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activity or there's a record of such an impairment, or being regarded as having such an impairment. And actually, I think in the pulmonary clinic, I don't know for sure, but I think that we have more children that actually have a 504 plan than an IEP. Uh, so section 504, physical impairment, is described as any physiological disorder or condition, cosmetic disfigurement or anatomical loss affecting one or more of the follow body, following body systems. The neuro, neurological, musculoskeletal, special sense organs, respiratory, so that's where a lot of your children might fall, cardiovascular, reproductive, digestive, genitourinary, hemic and lymphatic, or skin. And then the mental impairment is defined as any mental or phys physiological disorder such as mental retardation, organic brain syndrome, emotional or mental illness, and specific learning disabilities. Then the major life activities include, but are not limited to, caring for oneself, performing manual tasks, seeing, hearing, eating, sleeping, walking, standing, lifting, bending, speaking, breathing is the one that qualifies a lot of the children that we follow, learning, reading, concentrating, thinking, communicating, and working. So you can see how this, you can capture a lot more children in this category. Um, substantially limits is interpreted as an inability to perform a major life activity that the average student or person of approximately the same age or grade can perform, or significantly restricted, limited, as to the condition, manner, duration under which a particular life activity is performed as compared to the average student of approximate, approximately the same age. The impairment must be substantial as compared to the average student of approximately the same age. So it's a much broader category. Now, Section 504 covers any student that meets its disability definition, including those who do not need special education services and require only accommodations or supplementary aids and services. Um, one example is the children that are diagnosed with cystic fibrosis, who we see in the pulmonary clinic, they are required, most of them have to take um, pancreatic enzymes before every meal and before snack. So if they need those enzymes, unfortunately, 
most schools don't allow the children to keep the medication on them, and they don't allow the teachers to keep them in their classroom. There are a few exceptions, but overall, the medication has to be kept in the um, nurse's office and administered by a nurse or somebody in that. Yeah. So the a lot of times the accommodation in the 504 plan for those children is that they are released um, 10 minutes before class time is over. Sometimes it will say in there that they can have a buddy that accompanies them to the nurse's office. They get their medication, they take it, and then instead of going back to join their class, they go right to the line and they go right to the front of the line um, for lunch so that they have enough time to eat and they don't lose out on playing with their friends after it. That's just one example. So the 504 plan referral, each school site has a designated 504 coordinator. The parent must make a request in writing preferably to have the child evaluated for a 504 plan. The parent should bring medical documentation of the student's physical or mental impairment. And then the timeline is 60 days from when the parent makes the request. Some sample accommodations and modifications are unlimited bathroom privileges, access to water or water bottles at their desk, preferential seating, extended time to complete assignments, tests or projects, modified assignments, um, a scribe, it's usually another student to take notes, a copy of class notes, assignments provided when hospitalized or home IVs in a timely manner. Um, attendance will not count against their grade. I actually know of one parent that was successful, and I don't really know how she did this, but she was able to get written into the 504 plan that when the janitor cleans the classroom every night, in addition to the regular cleaning that he does for every room, he also wipes down every desk in that room. Um, and that is, they slip that in there under infection control. So a lot of this depends on just how savvy you are. Um, so if you have concerns that the IEP is not being adhered to, then you can contact the school principal or contact the special service department. I believe that would be the coordinator, the 504 coordinator. Linda? Probably the coordinator's boss. The coordinator's boss, okay. Um, contact the school district mediator or contact the Department of Education. Hopefully, you would not have to go that far. Um, you know, the hope is that you would be able to work with the school personnel because I think that they probably would be working with you and your child for a long time. So you really want to try to develop a positive relationship with them. And these are some local resources. I guess there's not very many people from San Diego here, but these are the three, um, I think, really good resources that we have for that. And those are the resources that I used. So. so the difference between an ISHP and a 504 is the ISHP, one of the, one of the main differences between an ISHP and a 504 is the ISHP does not have the legal mandates, the laws behind it. So the 504 has more meat and more bite to it. So if you find that you have a very cooperative school that is meeting your child's need, you are perfectly fine to go with the ISHP. But if you're having any problems with the school district, they're saying they don't have um, staff to accommodate your child's needs or, you know, we can't take care of your child's oxygen needs at school, then you're going to need to go to the next step and go and, and use a 504 or IEP plan to meet that child's legal needs so that they don't have a choice in the matter. Your children are all eligible for ISHP, 504, and IEP maybe, probably, but depends on the severity of your disease process. We're, well, we're going to take some questions and answers, and we would again want to remind you to pass the mic around so it can be recorded. Yeah, I just wanted to say um, my, my son started, I mean, at a new school this year. We were at a private Catholic school last year, and we went to public school this year, and um, I was strongly cautioned not to do a 504 or an IEP, and then I found out later that um, if I didn't, if I did one now, then I was more likely to have an established thing for the rest of his education, and it was much easier to do at elementary school. So we went back and did the IEP, and I'm so glad that I did because um, I had a piece of paper to take to my school's classroom, and 
there if I didn't get if my son didn't get the contagious precautions or for us it's heat tolerance and tolerance and when it's above 80 degrees he gets to stay inside he has water bottles he gets to put water over his head which the other kids want to do um, and, the, and the teacher didn't want him to do it and so he I was able to go and and with that piece of paper so I would strongly urge you if you're even if your school district is accommodating to go ahead and get that stuff in writing especially when they're young so you can refer back to that once it's in there and it's in their record it's in there forever mm -hmm. um, and then it's just a renewal process each year um, and it just it just makes your life a lot easier um, to, to do it even if your school district is and you absolutely should have both an ISHP and a 504 or IEP. So just because you have a 504 or an IEP doesn't mean you don't have an ISHP. It's referenced in the 504 and it's referenced in the IEP and it should be attached to the IEP and the 504, which gives it the legal bite. So um, you, um, there's a lot of accommodations that go in the ISHP that are day-to-day -day accommodations that you and the nurse can change. If you have it, those accommodations written in the 504 of the IEP, you have to pull the whole team together to make changes to it. And the, five, the ISHP is a flexible document that can change as often as you want it to change. But it does, once it's paired with a 504 or an IEP, it does have the legal um, protection of those laws that you are covered under the 504 and IEP. I just wanted to share, uh, I'm a teacher, and um, I have a son who goes to a private school who, um, they don't do 504s and IEPs in private schools, but they have similar programs where I live, they called it an individualized education plan, or uh, individual service plan, an ISP. Um, but the, even if you are in a private school, um, you can get these kinds of plans. And um, my daughter went to public school because they provided more of the services she needed. Um, just as we've all encountered um, not the best doctors or possibly nurses or residents or things in our life, you will also encounter not the best aides or teachers. Um, and nobody has the right to tell you that your child can't have their oxygen. And I just tell them, you, you realize you're discriminating against my child. And you use the word due process and things happen. <laughs> You mentioned private schools. I just wanted to know what kind of things private schools have to follow by law, or if they have to follow anything by law. Well, the, the, the IEPs and the 504s, uh, those are mandated for any school that receives federal and state money. So a lot of the private schools don't. And therefore, if they don't, then they're not going to fall under those guidelines. So a private school does not have to accommodate you in any sort of way or do anything for not, you? Not as far as I know. I mean, I've heard from a lot of parents that I see in the clinic that they're very happy with their child's placement in the private school. But it tends to be more of a, um, this teacher this year is great and is being very helpful. And then there's the next year when it's not so great. And the other thing to keep in mind is the older that your child gets, the more difficult it's going to be. Uh, first grader missing one day of school, two days of school, even three, is one thing. Once you're in middle school, that's a whole different thing, and it's really difficult to keep up. If you don't have the 504 plan in place, it's really a hard thing for your child to have to come back to. They're missing class assignments and tests, sometimes projects, and they can get penalized for that if you don't have the 504 plan. The other thing you can do if you're in a private school is you can go to your neighborhood public school and have your assessments done there at their neighborhood private public school. So you can have your child assessed, but your private school is not obligated to meet the accommodations or meet the plan if they're not funded federally. One thing that we did when we were in, in Catholic schools, when we were going looking at the schools, we interviewed the schools to find out what accommodation there was. And, and so we actually chose our school based on the ability, for, I mean, their willingness to work with us. And we were a lot happier because I mean, because our class size was small and our teachers did a lot of nap, you know hand washing and things like that. But I did want to mention something that um, you hit in a response to something you said. I made a big mistake when I did my IEP this year because um, it said that, that school miss didn't count against grant. But the problem is, is that in our school district, and I think most of the, the public schools, is you have to have a doctor's note to excuse the abs absences. So 
Um, and I don't take Grant to the doctor all the time. I mean, we just don't. We avoid the cesspool that's in the waiting room. So um, I had to actually add a clause to mine that um, I was that I was allowed to authorize my son to be out of school um, as with with just a discussion with the nurse at the school, and we didn't actually have to bring in a note and physically see somebody. And that was just that was just I figured I you know. I'd had experience doing this. I knew what I was doing, but I made that was the biggest mistake. We got in a lot of trouble in the middle of the year because Grant missed mm -hmm. five days, so that he can't miss another, and we had and we got in trouble. So keep that in mind. If yeah, you I that. agree with Anne. We we work with a lot of parents of kids with chronic health conditions, and we'll excuse your kids just on your word when you know we know what you're dealing with. So as long as that's already set up, depends on the school. <laughs> yeah, but if you have an IEP or a 504, I'd write it in. We always write in that absence clause. But as far as talking to the, the nurse about it, um, if it's a case-by-case -case basis, and we have a lot of parents that we just, that we don't require the note. It's only the parents that are abusing the privilege and, are, and that we question whether or not they're keeping their kids out for a legitimate reason that we even ask for the doctor's note. So, but that's a district-by-district district thing. The other thing, too, is work with your physician. Um, there are several physicians in the pulmonary clinic that have actually just written on a pres prescription pad, uh, not electronically in Epic or anything, just old-fashioned writing it out, patient not to attend school when he has these symptoms, and we'll list them, and then at the bottom we'll put per mom's report, and that's it. Then they're not penalized for it. Um, I just wanted to say that um, I'm also a teacher, and uh, we're in Canada. It's kind of the same thing. There is the government regulation in terms of um, special needs and, and how um, everything's followed through. We have an IPP. And um, I just wanted to caution people that even though your child may have an IPP or the 504 um, established, make sure that you follow through. There are a lot of teachers that aren't great out there. And just because it says in the document that this is in place for your child, a lot of times it's it doesn't get followed through. I'm actually an IPP coordinator, and so I am on top of the other teachers and reading their IPPs, making sure they're written properly and followed through. And it can be sickening how often they're neglected or not followed through or not written at all. And parents aren't aware of that and they you know sign off at the beginning of the year and by June you know this IPP that's been collecting dust at the bottom of someone's pile has not even been looked at and kids needs have been neglected so just make sure that when you have your IPP or your IEP or 504 established that you're following through and I think um, probably the easiest way to do that is it there it's an accountability on the teacher's part so whatever you have in there as goals and it has to be measurable make sure it's in some way measurable that it's documented. It's a checklist, it has to be documented in anecdotals that these note that these goals were met or followed through with. So that at any point in time you can come in and say, show me, give me proof that you are following these goals for my child. But lots of times they're not. Um, I was just gonna say as far as the our doctor actually they they did a presentation almost identical to this for families with special needs children. Um, and it kind of, when I first saw it, I felt like, oh my gosh, 60 day process, all this. But it was actually really easy for us um, in our school district to start. I just went to the um, secretary and said, this is the situation. She gave me all the paperwork. They have a specific form that I take to my doctor and, and the doctor fills it out. And it, made it, it makes it really easy from a parent standpoint for my doctor and we just write in like you were saying all, all the specific things like because will he's only on oxygen at school um and so we had to write but we had to write specifically he's only on oxygen when he is sitting doing school work so that the school um you know doesn't try and take and off. Sorry, that's okay <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> um. now, now, in California, oxygen is a spec. It's a specialized physical health care procedure, so you have additional paperwork to do in California than what you had. had. So yeah, it ours depends. Was pretty you gotta, casual. <laughs> you got to check your school district regs and, and, again, know who your contact person is so you're getting the right information. Yeah, but it was nice because our doctor was good and, and our nurse worked really well with us as far as saying, okay, make sure that your doctor writes specifically at the school desk and not during, and we had to write specifically not during music, PE, um, 
assemblies, whatever. And so our doctor just wrote it out. But it was nice because they had the paperwork from our school, and then I was able to take it. And our doctor was great, too, if, if you have a good pediatrician or pulmonologist, whichever you're working with, um, that they contacted the school if there's any questions. Um, I think that a big part of it for me is that, that my team really, uh, my, my pediatrician is, is who we work specifically with. And our school, you know, they were able to work really easily together. And it was, it, it hasn't, it wasn't like we had to wait 60 days. I know that they, there's a time frame they had to, but at least for us, you know, they weren't, oh, well, we've got 60 days to wait to, you know, get this filled out. <laughs> they made it happen quickly for us. And it's been really nice for And you can get everything in place without the 504 IEP. If you're going to the nurse and doing your ISHP, you can get everything in place and working while you're working through that legal process of the 504 and IEP. Again, a benefit of the IS, ISHP. Yeah. They were funny about the, the one thing that I would say is that they were having oxygen in school is really unique, obviously. Yeah. Um, and they have the fire marshal because it's a fire hazard. Um, you have to have signs on all the doors, so we had to get that from our oxygen provider. Things like that, and um, they couldn't store it in school, so he had to bring it every day. And, and we, just so you know, we actually bought a Camelback, um, one of the smaller ones, so that he could carry it more comfortably to school, and it doesn't look like, oh, what's that? So he hide, So it can hide for him, and then it's under his desk so that it's not as... Because it was a big deal for him this year to have to, this was his first year, and it was a really big deal. So we tried to make it as discreet as possible. I just wanted to share there are huge Department of Transportation regulations regarding transporting of oxygen. Once I showed our principal who was scared the tanks were going to blow up. She was afraid if she knocked them over, they would blow up. So that because she was scared, my daughter couldn't come to school. Um, once we showed her the regulations regarding the transportation, then they agreed to store it at the school. So they just had it delivered to the school. So when the de delivery came to my house, they also, the same day, would deliver to the school. Um, Department of Transportation regulations? Uh, we went through, I'm in Illinois, so I just went to IDA.